Good morning and welcome to this Darcy seminar series that is dedicated to ancient DNA, a rather fascinating topic to archaeology, anthropology, evolutionary biology and the environmental sciences. Almost 40 years ago, short DNA fragments were extracted and sequenced from the dried muscle of a museum specimen of the quagga, a species of zebra that became extinct at the beginning of the 20th century, marking the birth of ancient DNA research. The discovery that an invisible molecular past could survive in the archaeological record has had a transformative effect on the field of archaeology, enabling the identification of new branches within the human family tree, such as the Denisovans, the close relatives of the Neanderthals, the study of the complex processes of plant and animal domestication, as well as the historical emergence, virulence, and spread of major infectious diseases. Despite its tremendous potential to shed light on past live ways, ancient DNA is limited by a simple factor, ancient DNA preservation. Cyprus is located in a region that is not favorable to the survival of this sensitive biomolecule. The combination of high temperatures and a relatively constant humidity under the surface, as well as the extremely acidic or alkaline soils, foster a rapid geogenesis of the archaeological bone material, eventually leading most of the times to DNA loss. Of course, environment, climate, and soil conditions are factors that we archaeologists cannot control. However, there are certain factors that we can monitor in order to encourage the survival of ancient DNA. This includes the way bone material is treated during and after excavation, as well as the conditions under which archaeological material is stored. Taking into account that ancient DNA analysis is an inherently invasive method that requires the destruction of sometimes irreplaceable archaeological material, the selection of samples requires caution and care, as well as strong collaboration and good communication between archaeologists and paleogeneticists. Today, we have the pleasure to have with us Dr. Valeria Mattiangeli, lab manager and senior research scientist at the Smurfit Institute of Genetics at Trinity College Dublin, who will touch on some of these sensitive topics and share with us her long-standing experience with ancient DNA. But before introducing Valeria and her research background, I would like to invite Professor Stavros Malas, who apart from being the Institute's uh, president, he's also a geneticist, uh, to welcome the talk. Professor Malas. Thank you, Anna. Good morning, everybody, and apologies for the delay. So, in terms of my research background, when I came to the Institute, I thought I am the odd one out. Uh, because a geneticist in a technology institute, at least at this present, is probably not fully aligned. But now, at least, is the first lecture we have that uh, will very, be very close to my speciality. Well, genetic research, of course, has moved so fast uh, I remember the days when I was a PhD student and uh, the sort of techniques we learned at the time. And now I recall back that whatever I did during my PhD, at least 70% of it now it can be completed within 48 hours. So this is the speed with which um, the, the tools have moved, um, have evolved. And now with um, NGS and so on, we can compare. Uh, before we, we were sort of struggling to record the DNA of a single species. Now we obviously look at the DNA of individual individuals within a species and comparing and so on. The good thing about DNA, of course, it doesn't change very fast. And because it doesn't change very fast, you can actually look at the DNA thousand years ago, of course, with all the technical difficulties and compare it with what we have. Now, Anna is working on a very interesting project. Now, it's an interesting project, not because of the genetic perspective, but because um, I've always had a strong interest about these um, breeds of, of cattle we have in Cyprus and with your year working on a teaming proposal and we hope to be able to actually increase the number of these highly adapted animals for the country. Now, these animals were workers. They were working heavily, plowing uh, the, the land. Um, uh, when uh, we moved from, from, from Augusta to, to Bafos, 
uh, I was actually stunned in 1974 that essentially there were no plowing machines, essentially, there were only animals. So even within a small uh, a country like Cyprus, the difference between what happened in Famacusta in terms of industrial capability or, uh, and in Bafos was quite um, amazing, uh, the, the difference. Uh, now these animals are, uh, are there to be seen by tourists. That's all they are doing. Uh, there are a few, um, uh, a few uh, units and we hope to be able to increase them and reintroduce them back to the community for different reasons. Now, I'd like to welcome you to the Cyprus Institute and hopefully uh, your expertise will be able to answer the questions that Anna wants to answer and uh, will be here to support it in any way we can. So, Valeria, thank you. going to say a few words about our speaker uh, to know her background. Uh, Valeria Mattiangeli was born in Italy where she completed an undergrad degree in zoology at the University of Milan. Before embarking on a PhD in the field of population genetics, Valeria's work focused on animal behavioral ecology and more specifically on the fighting tactics and agonistic interactions of the male European fallow deer during the rat season. Her PhD, based on a collaboration between the National University of Ireland at Cork and the Trondheim Biological Station in Norway, focused on the taxonomic status and genetic population structure of uh, Trisopterus minutus, a temperate marine fish belonging to the coat family. For the last 20 years, Valeria has been working with Professor Daniel Bradley and his research group at the Smurfit Institute of Genetics, where she's also managing the ancient DNA wet and dry laboratories. Valeria is spending most of her time in the basement, dealing with difficult archaeological samples, including uh, bone, teeth, parchment, hair, and mummified bodies from a wide range of archaeological periods and sites. Uh, spanning Mag Magdalenian France, Jomon, Japan, Neolithic Ireland, Siberia, and the Middle East. She is constantly trying to understand the factors that are mostly affecting the survival of ancient DNA within different archaeological substrates, updating old and developing new protocols, maintaining databases, as well as teaching students and new researchers how to process archaeological samples. Her expertise in ancient DNA techniques spans from triage of ancient biological material to next generation sequencing. I had the luck to meet and work with Valeria last March when I visited called uh, Ireland in order to analyze some archaeological cattle bones from Cyprus. During our work in the lab, we have been talking about the need for a closer, mutually respectful collaboration between archaeologists and paleogeneticists. It is in this context that I have invited Valeria to come to Cyprus and share with us her long-standing experience with ancient DNA. Valeria, welcome to Cyprus. We are very happy to have you with us today, and we are looking forward to learn more about this biomolecule. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much, Anna, for inviting me and uh, all the Institute of Cyprus. I'm really excited to be here. This is an incredible um, experience. Thank you. So I hope to give you an overview of what we do in Ireland and to give you some information that could be useful for uh, this collaboration. So first of all, I want to talk about our beautiful college where we work. This is uh, Trinity College, is uh, the oldest uh, college in Ireland. A beautiful place to visit, a really buzzing college. Uh, specifically, this is the um, long room. It's a library in Trinity. Uh, it was used also in one of Star Wars uh, film, <laughs> but uh, the original one is definitely nicer to visit. This is the layout of our campus, and uh, we are at the back. Here is where our institute is. Where we work is the Smurfit Institute of Genetic, School of Genetics and Microbiology. This is a bit more modern than the front part of the college. Um, our group is uh, led by Professor Dan Bradley. 
We are uh, four research fellows that work uh, with him and six PhD at the moment. However, we tightly work with other four groups. Some are um, spin-off from our group, others are more specialized in uh, other topics, but it's quite varied, and uh, these groups are made of three research fellows and six PhD. So you can see it's quite a big group and quite diverse, and this is really what makes it interesting uh, to work there. We have a tiny but efficient uh, uh, ancient DNA lab properly uh, set up to uh, avoid contamination and to work with the highest of the standard. Right, let's start talking about the challenge of working with ancient DNA. So the first challenge is limited supply. And we are completely dependent on you guys, archaeologists, curators, to give us whatever is available, which we know it's not always a lot. Then the next challenge is that um, when we do manage to get something and we do manage to get DNA, the DNA is degraded. And degraded means um, it's very short fragments, which uh, this creates a challenge for the further analysis. It's chemically damaged, which is also something that it's important because identified as ancient DNA, but it again creates problem. Also, when we get it, often it's present in very low concentration. And uh, again, uh, creating more challenges. Not only the low concentration of the DNA itself, but within the DNA that we manage, we often get contaminants. So the endogenous is the DNA that belongs to the sample that we are actually analyzing. But there's a lot of, of what we call exogenous, and the exogenous can be anything else. And so um, we have to deal with both of them and we can't separate them beforehand. Finally, but not least, is the cost. Uh, in the last years, the cost has uh, massively reduced through thanks to new technologies such as uh, next generation sequencing that allows to sequence a huge amount of samples and DNA for a reduced cost. Nevertheless, we are still talking about thousands of euros. So this is an example just to give you an idea of what we work. In this hypothetical sample, we have a human tooth. And when we extract the DNA of all the DNA that we managed to extract, as you can see, there's DNA from everything else. Plants, soil bacteria, fungi, pathogens. And what we, in our case, would be looking for is a 1% of the whole thing. So this is what we work with, and it needs to be uh, bear in mind. So I want to, uh, one of our uh, targets is obviously try to avoid contamination. And um, except for the contamination that is intrinsic in the, in the sample, and this is nothing we can do about it, there are certain things that we can try to minimize. One is the manipulation of modern uh, DNA the, uh, and, and the growth of bacteria that are modern. Um, the good thing is that when we are working with that, we are able to identify it at a later stage if it's modern versus ancient. However, this is a, a step when we already have sequence, we already have spent the money, and so it's a bit of a waste basically for us. The other important things on our site, and this is something that we can do, is to keep our lab at a high standard, avoiding fundamentally cross-contamination between samples. And one simple thing is to try to work with uh, not a too big number of samples, because as you can imagine, if, uh, and this is, could be human error, two samples from the same species, from the same time period, from the same location, get cross-contaminated. There's no way that you can identify them. 
And if one has a much higher endogenous than the other, we suddenly have surprising results that are not real. So this is also another important thing. Just want to tell you a little story that happened in our lab. This was a collaboration with Emily. Emily is one of our PhD students, now postdoc. So at the time we were working with, uh, uh, this is a, well, a human skull, and it belongs uh, to the uh, Magdalenian period. And as you can see, the skull is, um, was re-glued together. And um, I, we were asked to do some um, ancient DNA uh, work. When the skull is like this, obviously we try to minimize as much as possible the, the destruction of the, of the bone. Um, so initially we started drilling in a way so that to take powder without compromising anything of the structure. So we got some powder. However, we also managed to get a little fragment of Petrus. I'm going forward here quickly just for the sake of, of this story. And we kept the bone. Um, so we went back to the lab and started analyzing our DNA from the powder because the powder was already available. And we got this strange pattern. So what this is, we have on the X, this is the read length. So it's the size of our fragment of DNA. And this is how many of this fragment we have. Generally, ancient DNA is, it peaks at around 50 uh, base pairs, so 50 letters. Um, the, but what we saw that was uh, no, no, we saw that wasn't normal was this wavy structure of the um, of the distribution, and we know from experience that this is contamination. So these are two distributions that are overlapping. So Emily went off and did an incredible work, um, check all sorts of possibility. We even thought about whale, because I know that whale glue is used to glue back. It was used to glue back samples. The reconstruction of the skull was done in the 1800s. So, but anyway, at the same time, we decided to go back to the actual fragment of bone. We extracted DNA, and at this point we had the nice distribution that we were expecting without any wave. So this was proper DNA. What she found in this one was uh, Y chromosome <coughs> contamination, while we know that this uh, skull is female. And the haplogroup of this Y chromosome is an haplogroup that appear in Europe all after the Neolithic, so it could not belong to somebody at the time of this lady. So what we hypothesized was that probably the curator that was a male, while it was gluing back the samples, must have left some of his DNA in it, and by chance we managed to extract and so all this to say, yes, if you manipulate the samples with bare hands, it, we, we, it can contaminate the sample, but if you have Am Emily in the lab, she managed to find it out. <laughs> but we sequence it, and so again, it's cost. It's um, samples that uh, you can't, can't use. Anyway, let's move on. Um, I want to show you, um, I've been very lucky through my career to be able to work with uh, several different type of uh, substrate. And uh, so what we did, we worked with OTSIS clothes, for example. I'm sure that you are all familiar with the, this mummified man from the Copper Age that was found in the Alps. And uh, for example, we managed to find out that uh, the skin used, the leather skin used to do the hat was from a bear. The quiver was uh, from deer. Uh, shoes was from uh, cow, and so on and so forth. So it was really good with the ancient DNA uh, being able to um, identify all the different species. Then we also worked with taxodermic samples. Um, in Ireland we have uh, the old Irish goat. It's a pop native population of Ireland which is in danger because uh, the diversity and, uh, is being very much reduced. So we, had, we worked with um, taxodermic samples that were donated from also Scotland, from the UK, and thanks to this study where identified the uniqueness of this population, now it's a protected uh, breed, and uh, this is excellent for Ireland. 
we worked with bog butter. In Ireland, uh, we have, uh, there was this tradition of uh, burying bog uh, butter into bog. We don't know yet if it was for, um, as a present to the gods, uh, or if it was uh, for preservation. Um, not sure for preservation, because <laughs> The taste and the smell is not uh, really good. I haven't tasted though. Um, and uh, so what we did, we extracted the DNA from the butter and we found out that it was made from different species. So it wasn't just cattle as what we expected. We found goat and we found sheep as well. And it was interesting because the uh, oldest bog butter that we analyzed was from the Bronze Age. So it was a sign of management of goat in the Bronze Age in Ireland. Um, yeah, we also found uh, extracted DNA from a natural mummified sheep from Iran. And um, the amazing thing of this was that the fragment, as I said, when they are ancient, they're usually short. These were really long. In fact, we even thought this can't be ancient, and instead it is ancient. And uh, we found, we managed to identify the uh, variance that is associated. So the, this, this um, sheep still didn't have the variant that makes the sheep woolly, woolly sheep. So it was uh, still in the archaic type. Uh, finally, we also worked with parchment, and um, basically, uh, this was um, Sarah, Sarah Fiedman here, who uh, had this brilliant idea of um, using, so when the parchments are clean, they actually use a rubber like that to clean the parchment. And uh, to extract the DNA, ideally you want a little piece of parchment, but uh, not always it's a possibility. So she thought, why don't we try to use the rubbings from the rubber? Uh, because some of the fiber gets trapped, and we managed, we did. We are able to extract DNA from it quite well, so now we are able to identify the exact species from uh, the parchments, which are great resources because usually you know the date, you know where they come from, and so on and so forth. So all of this research were really interesting. However, our favorite uh, substrate is bones. And uh, specifically in our lab in 2014, Christina Gamba was able to identify the Petrus bone as the best uh, resource. So this is a few Petrus bones from different animals, uh, our, favorite, uh, um, our favorite substrate. However, lately we are starting not to use only Petrus. We are starting to be able to work with other bones. And this is what I'm going to show you uh, through uh, this talk. But first, I want to ex uh, explain what happened when a bone or a sample arrive in our lab. So that it makes clear, because sometimes I appreciate from archeological archeologists or a museum curator, it looks a bit like a black box. They send the samples and then come out the results. So I think it's important to appreciate what, uh, what this involves. So on arrival, we always take digital pictures unless it has been already taken by the um, curator or archeologist. We then uh, have now a 3D scanner. So we take a 3D scan, uh, scan of the uh, bone in this case. We don't do a printing, but we have all the files. So the files then can be sent back to whoever needs to print. And then, of course, we record everything on a database where samples, arrival, uh, location, uh, everything is recorded. After that, it started the drilling process. And we have, we try to be, to drill in the last, least destructive way. Uh, however, at the same time, it's important to make sure that we get the densest part so that um, the destruction is uh, um, efficient, is not. Uh, so this, this is a human Petrus. I have humans just because it's the nicest pictures that I have. And one technique is uh, this V shape that we do. So to go down to near where the cochlea is. So that's uh, the densest part. We're getting even better now. We do even uh, sharper V, so even less destructive. Another technique is instead opening the petrus, in this case, in half, 
And then with, uh, with the drill bits like this, we go around again and we are able to target the densest part and then you can close it back. So it looks a little bit destructive, but this can be done only if the bone is in really good condition because when you cut it in half, sometimes it could, um, it could break. So um, this is what I was telling you about before. Sometimes I have to go and drill from the back to reach the petrous bone um, and collect all the powder as it comes out, but it could create <laughs> surprises. It could give surprises. Um, Obviously, we don't do just a human. We mainly do actually animals. This is a petrus from a cattle, and this is how we cut them. And then when we have other type of bones, we always try to focus on the densest part. And this is when actually I think a collaboration with people that knows more than us where densest part are is crucial because we are geneticists. We are not, we don't know the anatomy that well. So a constant talk and conversation is, is really important for us. Um, this is the type of drill that we use. It's quite specialized and the drill bits are very precise. And this is the uh, shaker. So when we have our little piece of bones, we put it into this uh, cylinder and we shake it to create powder. So powder, powder can come in different color, different uh, grains, uh, very fine and not so fine. We always work on that to see what is the best to extract. We then uh, extract the DNA. It's a process that have different steps, uh, usually overnight. And then we build what is called a library. Uh, what it means, and I'm here just to explain, uh, when we sequence DNA, uh, we need to have uh, synthetic sequences that are attached to each fragment. So if we think of this black part being our DNA, we attach to this uh, fragment known synthetic uh, se uh, um, sequence. And this is making a library, that's what it means. And also this library have specific uh, sequence of, of uh, letter that we call index and they are unique to each sample. So each sample can be then bioinformatically identified. So then we uh, sequence them. This is the type of machine that we use. It's called a Novastic. It's one of the, it's not the super latest, but it's one of the latest. And uh, here what we get, this is our file, what comes out. So sequencing means to translate from a molecular sequence, which is in, our, in the DNA of the sample, into a text sequence that then we can use to do the following analysis. And this simple, quick, it takes a lot of time in the lab to do. Okay, so the, the last step of sequencing, again, is to understand what we, what it means. So as I said, remember I told you, this is what we get. But in our sequence, in what we, we, what we extract, what we sequence, does everything, does everything. So how do we manage to identify what is our sample? Oh, sorry, that's this way. So remember, we have now our file with uh, uh, the sequence of, of letters. What we do, this is for example, let's say we want to find out if this sequence belongs to our sample. We use a reference genomes. And that's again, it opens another, um, problem, if you want to say. While for human, the genome is very well characterized, the reference genomes, and it starts to be also for the main domesticates, which is what we use, it becomes quite a problem when we work with species that are not very well characterized. So this adds another challenge. So in this case, let's say this is our reference uh, genome at the bottom, and we, with a computer, obviously, we align this to uh, this is our fragment and we align it and we see, oh, okay, look, this aligns to this. This is not a typical ancient DNA <laughs> uh, picture. Usually you have much less, uh, much less uh, fragments. Specifically in this case, we can see that this individual at this site has both the letter A and the letter G. These are called SNPs and it's the type of mutation that we look for, because then we work from them. Okay, so one simple and last 
thing um, that can get a bit confused when we talk about these things. So uh, do you remember we have, uh, uh, this is a sample where our, our DNA is the red one, the, the endogenous DNA, not our, sorry, the sample DNA. And when we talk about endogenous content is the proportion of DNA sequences which belongs to the sample. And as you can see, it could be 1%, 2%, 10%, 60%, you wish, but it, it happens. Instead, often when we talk about uh, the genetic work, we talk about coverage. Coverage is a different thing. Coverage is the average number of sequencing reads which cover any given part of the reference genome. So while the endogenous is in, it's, it's, it's intrinsic in the samples. There's, we can do something technically to improve it, but it is what it is. With the coverage, it's something that if you have an unlimited amount of money and you keep sequencing a lot, you could certainly improve it. You will never arrive to the whole genome because there are technicalities, but you can improve it. So for example, in this case, we have this part where we have 5x coverage. So this part of the genome has been covered five times by reads, and it's, it's uh, so this is it. Uh, just to specify the, the different terminology. Okay. Okay, as I said, endogenous. Endogenous can be improved, and the one thing that we did in the lab that was uh, very important for us we found out that in, uh, it wasn't us, to be honest, it's, uh, it's a different publication, but we implemented in the lab um, that pre-washing the, the powder with a, a light solution of bleach had improved massively the uh, endogenous content. As you can see, these are 150, 105 samples from different species we use as a test and every sample is uh, being uh, extracted with, uh, without the bleach in blue and with the bleach uh, wash in red. And this is the endogenous percentage. So you can see generally the red is much higher than the blue. And this convinced us that yes, it's something that we need to implement in our lab. Another way to see this is we have on the X the endogenous of known bleach samples and on the Y of bleach samples, and again, the majority is on the, this side, with important to remember a, a, a spot around between zero and 5%, where things can go either way, Not, they don't always improve. But um, we, we are willing to take this risk, and usually by default, unless the samples are very uh, old and very, very precious, we usually go for the bleach. We always keep some powder to go back and change our protocol if required. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank, this is not the end of the talk, but I really like to uh, thank all the people that um, helped me and they are contributing uh, for the data that I'm about to present. Present, past, also the archeologists, the curators, everybody, because uh, without uh, this, this would not be possible. So our data, okay, what I'm going to present now is uh, about, yeah, it's 1,640 samples that we have processed in our lab. This is not even the lab, the most updated. They are still producing, there are more. I'm presenting uh, um, four different species, three domesticates, sheep, cow, and goat, and oryx. So I talk about the bleach and non-bleach because all the presentation is this two a type of extraction are kept separated because I think it wouldn't be correct to merge everything. So you, as you can see, the numbers are quite high. So I think they start to show something that we can really believe most of the time. Okay, this is the petrous bone. What I want to show you here is how good the petrous bone is. Probably you all already know, but it's nice to see numbers. So we have, these are the known bleach sample and uh, the colors are telling us uh, what is the endogenous percentage that each of these bone um, gave us. This is a mix of petrous bone from all the species, all the time period, all the um, different locations. And um, as you can see also already with known bleach samples, we have a good 36% of our bones giving us endogenous over 20%. This is good for us, this is really good. 
We then can add an 8% eight, eight at 10, between 10 and 20, and about 36%, about the other, that are less than 1%. This is not great. When we bleach the samples, as you can see, we have 50% of the bones working at this uh, over 20% uh, endogenous. And the number of bones that worked less well reduced quite, uh, quite a lot. So this is really a nice uh, way to see that the petrus really works, really works best, and the bleach helped for the petrus. However, I think it's always important to put things into context. So in this very colorful uh, slides, I've uh, separated, I have put um, on the X the different time periods. So we have Paleolithic, Neolithic, Chalcolithic, uh, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Medieval, Modern, and Unknown. Often we also have the unknown. Uh, this is uh, the colors uh, correspond to the area. Uh, they are very broad areas, and the reason is that uh, a lot of this uh, data are not published yet, so we have to keep it vague, <laughs> let's say, but eventually they will be more uh, precise. And uh, the shape of uh, the dot is the type of species that I'm talking about. So I think what I want to show you here is that what you can see, yes, the petrus works, we know that um, in a range, but when we do the, no, the bleached samples, the majority of the samples, as I showed before, seem to work. And uh, both have samples that are come from similar areas, so you can see the colors are more or less similar. So at least that variable is um, equivalent. Okay, I now want to do a more species by species show, um, presentation where we go through not the bone, not the petrus. We know the petrus works. Okay, but there's so much more out there. Can we use other bones? I think so. Um, this is sheep, okay, and uh, as always, we have the known bleach extraction sample, and this was before we introduced the bleach, and as you can see, yes, femur worked, teeth had potential, astragalus, yeah, we had something in it, tibia, but then metacarpal, calcaneus, metatarsal, some school, unknown bone, there's always some of them, and long bone, they all had quite a poor uh, endogenous. Then when we start bleaching the samples, here we go, suddenly we have a phalanx that we didn't have here, but they gave us an incredible result. Astragalus, massive improvement from here to here. Um, teeth, again, we had much better uh, endogenous. Homerus, again, it's working. So mandible, long bone, tibia, metacarpal, calcaneus, radius, and then the metatarsal and ulna didn't, weren't successful. Of course, always we need to bear in mind where the bones come from and at what time, or time period they are. But for example, the phalanx, they are from the Bronze Age, from the Caucasus, and look, this was very good. Um, here, I la I, I've, I've done this to show you the differences. So this is uh, the endogenous content and it, the, the, the range is the same. It goes up to 60 and up to 60. With, with the bleach and the different, we, we cover a lot more than here. So here, if we want to see a bit more stretch, but then the reference is, is, uh, is different. But again, this gave us hope. And as you can see from the colors, a lot of these samples are also from south of Europe, from the southwest of Europe. So, I mean, they're starting to work, even coming from a location that are not uh, usually the best, and a range of period, of time period. So this is really, really promising, I think. Cow, again, same story. Again, we go into details. Um, it works, some of them were working, but we weren't focusing that much in those samples. Astragalus gave us some results, metatarsal, phalanx, metacarpal, long bones, calcaneus, um, skull, again, an identified type, part of the skull, while femurs, humerus, mandibular carpal, tarsal, tooth, were not great. However, when we start bleaching the samples, teeth became really an option. Now we start to have really good results. 
long bones. Again, uh, tibia was, yeah, now it's, it's much more, um, the metatarsal was good as well beforehand. We need to check where, and this is important to check where they came from. So these guys in reality were coming from Southern uh, environment, while these are more from the West of Europe and Central Europe. Nevertheless, there is definitely an improvement. Also, phalanx were not as uh, positive as for the sheep, but uh, a possibility. With cow teeth really are the one that gave us the best, although the tibia is also another possibility. Uh, and this, again, different range. Goat, goat. We have a bit less samples because we focus a lot on Petrus with goat. Initially, we saw this and was like, wow, the teeth really works in goat, no, no need to bleach. But then when you look at the teeth, they were modern. <laughs> the majority were modern, so that's why they worked so well. Um, and as, as well as the tibia. The tibia was medieval, so yeah, of course, it works. Um, Humerus uh, said this one was both Bronze Age and Neolithic. Metacarpal, postcranial, radius, and the other one didn't, weren't very successful. Then we have um, bleached, we have the humerus that worked, the tibia that worked, the radius, phalanx, we're starting to um, metatarsal teeth improved. This time the real teeth, they are uh, more from Neolithic site, um, mandibula, and so on and so forth. So. Oh yes, I also included the Primigenius because it's a project that we have in the lab. I mean, it's not a domesticate, but I thought it was still nice to see that even really ancient sample extinct uh, species uh, gave us some good results. Um, a lot of the samples from this work it's, um, were uh, from really ancient, uh, they were most Mesolithic, um, but still uh, we managed to get from teeth, from uh, mandibular from metatarsal, some even costa, which usually are not astragalus. Again, the star was the, the, the petrus. So the take home message from this part is the petrus is the best bone, uh, as, uh, as I, I showed. Bleach pre-wash increased the endogenous in petrus bone over all time period, always. Uh, but bleach pre-wash helps the use of other bones, although it seems so far but that it's a bit more species specific. Uh, but it's good to know because then we know when we find bones from a specific species, we can say, yes, there's a chance there. Yeah, no, forget. It's better not even touch it. Regarding this, I want to show you some specific example of what we deal generally. This is a project done by Anya. She's one of our PhD students on sheep. So we had two lovely uh, teeth in the mandible. And they come from the same site, this is Georgia, same time period. When I looked at this, I thought, brilliant, they are really good. I would definitely say, let's process them. This one had 5% of endogenous, which is not bad. This one had zero, less than one. And I, I, on, on inspection, I would have never thought that. Another, another situation is this tooth and this tooth. They are again from the same uh, site uh, in Italy, same time period. Both of them had open root, which usually I'm skeptical. I'd say mm, usually nothing comes out from them and not much. But then we analyzed this at 10%, surprise. And this one had zero, one, one, which was what I was expecting. So what's going on with teeth uh, of sheep? We need to look a bit more into that. Um, cattle, this is a project done by Deborah, another PhD student of us, and this is a cattle tooth. This, um, I would have said, this is great. I would say this is a great tooth. The uh, roots are perfectly intact, and yes, go for it. This one is, um, no, the, the roots are open, it doesn't look very good. These are different sites, but I, I couldn't see, I couldn't find from the same sites. Sometimes you don't have um, the possibility to compare. This one, in fact, had 20% as expected. This is 0% as expected. So maybe cattle are a little bit more predictable than sheep. 
So I decided to look into the teeth and um, I checked 112 teeth from photos that we had. This picture is just to show you, I wanted to make sure that I had a range of uh, uh, samples that was covering enough time period and enough location and enough endogenous uh, content to be able to compare them, okay? So, and at least for the sheep and for the boss, we definitely have that. Here we go. So, when I checked for open root, an open crown in sheep, it's completely unpredictable. <laughs> so you can have really samples that have open crown and open roots and they give us more than 10% or samples that have everything as they're supposed to have and they go give you zero. With the boss, it seemed a bit more predictable where you can see the blue, it means the close root and in fact, the majority of them that have closed root have a higher endogenous, while those that have open root tend to be a bit having less uh, endogenous. So the take, mes the take home message for the teeth is that open root for cattle tend to give lower endogenous, so we tend to not dis to discard those in sample, while closed root um, tend to be better endogenous. With sheep, Let's chance it because it could go either way. We don't know at this stage. It's, it's uh, in progress, so it could get better and, and, and better. Another little uh, project that we are trying to do, and this is all to figure out what to sample, what are the bones, what do they look like. So four bones from the same site, uh, same type of bone, tibia and tibia. Uh, this one. 10% this 0% sampled in different parts. Same story here, same, uh, same site, diff same bone. This is a, an omerus and this is an omerus. On the top, 4.7%, here 0.9%. So we thought, hmm, possibly it's where you samples could determine really the endogenous. So, I ask Anya to go back and resample the same bone at a different site, and she did. But it looked like, hmm, probably when we have a good bone, we just have a good bone, and when we have a bad bone, we just have a bad bone. However, we kept doing it and different to have a higher number. And what I can say is that from preliminary results, so as you can see, there are not many. Uh, we are still working on it. The, the top part tends to be the most successful one. Sometimes actually quite a massive difference. And I mean, this is also, 10 is good, but if you can have 18, well, it's better. Occasionally it's different, it's, it's the other way around. So again, and here again is when we need the archeologists or, or, or people that know more than us to tell us, yes, we know that this is the part of the bone where you should really focus. To finish my talk, which has been more descriptive and more technical, I thought I wanted to show you an example of what we managed to produce uh, with, uh, with um, samples that weren't um, all good. So this is a, a publication that uh, we, Marta Verdugo and Victoria Mullin were the leading authors that came out from our uh, lab. And um, what they analyzed were 67 ancient cattle, including six aurochs, with an average coverage of 0.9x. This is quite common in, uh, in ancient DNA. Uh, and the endogenous of some samples was 0.1 to 62%. So we also had samples that were very low in endogenous. Nevertheless, what they did, they managed, they did that this is a principal component analysis created with uh, 770 SNPs where uh, they were uh, put uh, modern samples um, that are in gray, uh, mo modern cattle, as, uh, and they are the, the shown in the typical um, bovine um, pattern where we have uh, the European Bostaros on this side, we have the African Bostaros here, and then we have the Bos Indicus on this side. And then they analyze with the same um, SNP the 67 ancient samples that are in color from all the different regions. 
And what they found was basically four main clusters. Uh, if, uh, an A cluster, which are Neolithic Balkans, and they plot mainly with modern Europeans. A B cluster here, which uh, it's a group of Anatolian and Iranian couple, that, and they are close to the four, four aurochs from the uh, Near East. So probably this is the, they are showing that they are more uh, related to the ancient, to the, the, to the aurochs, to the primigenians. And then two groups of Levantine cattle uh, separated by um, samples that belong to the C group were uh, earlier. So they are mainly up to the Bronze Age, Neolithic and Bronze Age. And all this group instead is after, so from Iron Age to um, postmodern, well, I, I, yeah, I, uh, post Iron Age. And the interesting thing is that these, after the Bronze Age, they cluster near the cattle with a bon Bos Indicus admixture. And in fact, we know that in the 4000, uh, there was a severe draft and um, basically uh, start to show some introgression in this uh, cattle, man-made, uh, where zebu bulls were introgressed with the cattle to try to make them more resistant to um, harried climates. And, uh, and then uh, I leave you with, uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. This is our lab with uh, Professor Bradley and uh, uh, all the different labs that we collaborated with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valeria. That was really interesting. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'm sure that there will be many questions from people. So, um, who would like to ask something, Valeria? Uh, thank you very much. That was really informative. Uh, I work with human remains, okay. and uh, over the past years, uh, we have also started using ER ossicles to extract DNA. You didn't mention anything about ossicles in your presentation, so I was just wondering, is this something that you're using also with animals, and if not, why not? Correct. So, yes, um, the reality is that uh, they're not easy to find. <laughs> it's, a, it's a problem with finding them. In, with the cattle, I would say... In all my experience, I might have found it five, six times. So, so inside the temporal bones, you hardly ever have them? Yeah, yeah. Did you say them? Really oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We, we found And even in human, to be honest, is not something that we find uh, very often. They are not that long. I mean, uh, we, we tend to find them, you know, when we are still in the soil. So because of the soil is in the ear, we don't wash them. So, That's uh, the problem, that uh, we don't do the excavation. <laughs> we, we, we get the petrus, we get that, and uh, if they have been taken care, yes, we are very aware that they are excellent and the DNA from the, these little bones seems to be fantastic. I think the problem may be having is that with animal bones, they are almost always washed because for archaeologists to yeah. do their work, yeah. they need to have them Completely. washed. Yeah. Whereas with human bones, we try to avoid washing. Yeah. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but in general, we try to avoid washing. Yeah. So it's more likely to find them. Yeah, no, but what you're saying is exactly, I know, we are, yeah. We, we depend on what we get. <laughs> And I guess that's why it's important, the paleogeneticists, to get involved into a project from the beginning and to explain what, to explain uh, what it will yeah. be needed in order yeah. to have ancient DNA analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Thank you very much for the lovely presentation. Uh, so, uh, if I understand correctly, no washing and using uh, gloves at all times? It would be better. Uh, that's very difficult. I know. Ideally, ideally would be, for example, this is, um, we, are, we hope to start working with sediments. And again, when you do this, which are a substrate where you even have less endogenous DNA, it becomes even more important to really avoid 
exposition to other. So as I said, we can identify modern DNA because it has a different pattern. Do you remember at the very beginning I showed the fragmentation? So ancient modern DNA would have all the reads that are towards the end of the tail because they are longer. But you have sequenced them. You have spent the money. Yes, by informatically you can separate them, but it's a waste. And uh, you get a less percentage of your endogenous. So what I would say working with globes would be good, um, if possible. Um, mask, because you breathe on the samples, and that again could, <laughs> could be another thing. And, um, but this for samples that you want ancient DNA from. I mean, samples that might not interest, it's, it's okay. And um, another, uh, another thing is, uh, 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 I, I forgot. Oh yeah, make sure that the samples are in a situation where you don't have mold growing on it. <laughs> It's a simple thing, but unfortunately, we sequence that. And very rich, very good uh, DNA, but not usable. So, yeah. It is impossible in, in the Mediterranean climate to work with uh, gloves or with masks. But we could maybe, if we see a Petrus bone, then say, uh, everybody wear gloves or put yeah. masks. Or... OK, thank you very much. Yeah, no, I understand the, the problems, yeah. Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. So my question is, when DNA becomes ancient, uh, how quickly this process is, I mean, is happening? Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of study on it, and um, what they have found is that the degradation of the DNA is pretty quick. Uh, at the, in the first maybe less than 100 years, it started to get short quite fast. And in fact, that's why in our contamination, the curator was from the 1800s, but the DNA was already, the, the, the fragmentation was already old. So that happened quite quick. And then it stabilized. And at that point, then, it the degradation, which is the fragmentation, the further fragmentation that gets to a point when it's completely destroyed, it m very much depends at that point of the environment. And it seems that a variation in temperature is something that is quite um, important. So high cons constant uh, uh, variation in temperature tend to degrade the DNA a lot more. So for example, once we get the, the samples and uh, the powder that we get, we, we, we keep it in fridge. That would be the ideal situation. What you want is a constant temperature, probably low. And uh, yeah, I, I understand it's not always possible, but that's why samples from cave works very well because the, the temperature is constant. And as Anna said previously, also the acidity of the soil seems to have quite an important uh, factor. But not uh, very impressive. Uh, um. Water log? Um, depends, depends. I don't have a huge experience with water log samples, but uh, they, they, they work sometimes, yeah. Because beyond the degradation, the general confirmation, what this happens? Sorry, the It doesn't seem to be a, a correlation between the deamination and the time. That's not something that is linear. It's still something that they're working on. It. You get you get some bacterial DNA and mm -hmm. some fungal DNA there. Yes. So you get some information that what sort of bacteria were hanging around. Yes. So. Some people are starting to do metagenomic analysis. This is starting to become quite a, an important. Um, we don't at the moment. Uh, we have a massive amount of samples where I think it would be an incredible, interesting work to do and see the different type of uh, bacteria from the different type of samples. Um, can't do everything, so we are focusing on the, on the endogenous. What, what we are starting doing is uh, pathogens, above all from teeth. That's something that we are really starting working on. Yeah, because the, the teeth, you know, relate also to yeah. diet and also to diseases. And Correct, so. exactly. So this is a new, a very new um, field mm -hmm. that uh, they are working in the lab a lot, both from domesticate and to human. Uh, and I, uh, it's, it's, um, it's very interesting. 
challenging again because not only you have samples, the samples DNA, you have to try to find the virus or the bacteria and you have to be lucky that by chance has been stuck in, in the bone that you're looking, that you're uh, analyzing. Exactly, it's having a vision, deciding what we want to do beforehand, and then... Yes, uh, my question is about question. Mm -hmm. when you say you analyze the food, you're referring to the bone that makes up the root? Yes. Or Again, I don't have a degree in anatomy, so, but from what I've read, the petrous bone is the best, and the reason why is because it's formed in the embryos. Okay, so it's not so much of, yes, it's the densest, but it's also because the internal part of the, the, the petrous is the most, it's the less exposed, okay? So it, while the embryo is growing, the cells that forms the bone gets enclosed into the petrous and then layer and layer and layer. So that part is the less exposed due to the density and that's why the DNA there is very well preserved. In the teeth, the enamel, as far as we found, usually they don't have a good preservation of DNA. And I think it's because of the process how the enamel is made of. Where we found the best DNA is from the cementum. And that's because it's where it's alive. It's where the, the, the cells are there with the DNA is there. And the, the teeth keep being built from the cementum. And that's where we usually try to target. And that's why I was surprised with the sheep where the bottom of the root, which is where the, ma the majority of the cementum is, it's missing and we still have good DNA. I don't know that, again, I'm, I, I don't know enough about the anatomy and the, 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 the biology of the teeth to, to figure out why. Just a suggestion, could the thickness of the root bone could, could possibly. affect rather than open and closed? Oh, possibly. Uh, in the sheep it looks, yeah, it's, it, I, I think so too. That's because there is also correlation, the yeah. open root is usually a, a, a corresponds to thinner mm -hmm. uh, Yanis Gyular is from the Department of Antiquities. Thank you for this introductory lecture. Um, my question is, as a field archaeologist, is, of course, your, your presentation focused on the selection for ancient DNA. Yeah. But uh, what about the research question? Who imposes the research question? So obviously, a geneticist has different research questions for a geologist and 
Mi es es an excavator or any excavator have may have certain uh, questions that that's why I'm giving you of course the, the samples but at the same time the, the, your research uh, questions would be uh, so what about this uh, matter or what are we looking for and yeah, yeah. Uh, is there a, a, the secondary and the same uh, part matter uh, question is um, and are there any bones once a better cert better certain uh, research questions or Sorry, I mean I any specific bones like the teeth or mm -hmm. any other bones that serves better uh, research questions let's say absolutely yes so to answer your first question uh, if i'm correct you're asking obviously we have different aim different uh, and yes indeed uh, I, I didn't present any of our project because i thought that's not my place i mean you should invite them <laughs> to do it and uh, and, and the purpose for me here was to show you how we select the bones, what is important, because that could be useful from a communication point of view. Uh, yes, of course, different question. Yes, for example, um, geneticists can uh, identify um, a relationship between, for example, in, in humans, uh, you sometimes you find uh, skeleton and birds to, to, together. Are these uh, related or not related? So with the genetics, you can figure it out. So it's a different question. Um, I think personally, the, the answer to that is again communication. Because uh, different aims, so what do you need from your samples? What do I need? Can we match? Sometimes we can't, so a, a choice needed to be done. And if, if I want to answer this question, I cannot sample the samples from the genetics because it will destroy the, some parts that are fundamental for my, so it's a choice. And you know, other times you say, well, but the genetics is really crucial to understand more, so it's worth it for that. So I think it's, it's communication, to be honest, that should be stated at the beginning of the project. So that is the first question. Sorry, the second question you asked me was about... Um, um, Oh, different ones, yes, and that's a bit what we touched uh, quite previously. For example, now that we are starting working with the pathogens, uh, they seem to be mainly in teeth. So unless we look for pathogens that are specific, uh, the, 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 um, the, um, the disease is present in the bone because uh, then we try to sample from the specific part of the bone, not always successful. Otherwise, for viral or bacterial, the teeth, and specifically at this point, it's not anymore the cementum. It's actually the pulp and the root canal. So it's a, it's a different technique. You're aiming for a different uh, part of the tooth. And uh, so, yes, definitely the different bones, uh, the different aim. <laughs> Thank you very much, Valeria, for being with us today. And yeah, communication and collaboration.